You are listening to Season 5 of Future Ecologies. Before we start the show, we want to send a huge thank you to our amazing community on Patreon. Future Ecologies just wouldn't be possible without you, and we are beyond grateful to have your support. We hope it's obvious that every one of our episodes is a pretty considerable effort. Every single patron means more ambitious stories, fair pay for more guest producers, musicians, and other collaborators, and gets us closer to a living wage to do what we love to do, making this show. We'd do it for free if we could, but until that day comes, we're relying on listeners like you. We make this show because we think it has the potential to make a real difference in the world. Maybe it's already made a difference in yours. So to keep this podcast going and growing while staying ad-free and independent, join us at futureecologies.net slash patrons. Okay, that's all. On to part two of Spider Song. Welcome back. My name is Mendel. And I'm Adam. And this is Future Ecologies. Today in Spider Song Part 2, we're taking our seats in the concert hall of life. Audience to the grand dance of evolution with taxonomist, phylogenetic theoretician, and jumping spider devotee, Wayne Madison. Hi, good to be back. In other words, we are jumping in right where we left off. So, do you want to give us a quick recap? Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, jumping spiders are basically like tiny, eight-legged, big-eyed cats slash birds of paradise, in that there are bedazzled males that court mates by dancing, and also by singing, in a manner of speaking. They vibrate. Yeah. Go on. Um, And not only are their species really diverse in shape and color, they also demonstrate a lot of convergent evolutionary patterns, which are not limited to independently and repeatedly developing color vision, ever more complex courtship rituals, a bunch of them have become ant-like, and there's something going on with their Y chromosomes. Yeah. Yeah. Mostly. Uh, the, the Y chromosome thing is actually just the one genus, Habronatus, not all jumping spiders. But it'll be important later on, I promise. Where we left off in part one, Wayne was overcome by his sense of awe that evolution isn't just an endless chaos of diversity. It seems to cohere around certain patterns, motifs, melodies, themes, and variations. It seemed to him like the grandest possible symphony. If only he could hear it. And at first I didn't know what to do with that, but then I thought, oh, I'm a computer programmer. I do visualizations of change on phylogenetic trees. Why don't I program a sonification of change on trees. I'm, I'm assuming what a visualization is to our eyes, a sonification would be to our ears. Yeah. Sonification is like transmogrifying data into sound in the same way that you might turn that same data into a graph. Sonification is the auditory equivalent. So last episode, we were figuratively talking about how evolution is a form of music. And now you're talking about literally making evolutionary patterns into music. Yeah, exactly. So this practice of sonification has been used to explore and communicate climate data, X-ray astrophotography, prime numbers, and even sequences of DNA itself. But what Wayne is talking about here is sonifying a phylogeny, an entire family tree of many organisms. 
A phylogenetic tree is a statement about the history of lineages in the past, and we can't actually go back in a time machine and see those lineages, so we have to reconstruct it. And we can reconstruct it with lots of data, occasionally through fossils, but mostly nowadays we use genetic data to reconstruct these trees. And it's pretty clear we're doing a pretty good job of it because we've got so much data that's all speaking to the same phylogenetic tree. But nonetheless, it's still a hypothesis. So to, to draw a phylogenetic tree, they have to gather specimens, sample their DNA, and assess them for different characteristics, like which ones have Y chromosomes. Then they use some of the statistical tools that Wayne developed to create an estimate of who branched off from who and what the characteristics of those ancestors were most likely to be. So like if a scientist took you and me, they could cast back and figure out who our most recent common ancestor was and what traits they might have had based on what you know about us and, and maybe some fossils. And some DNA. Yeah, in a computer program. Okay. Yeah, so, so after they've done that, they have a, a sequence of all these different lineages starting from a common root and then branching and changing through time. But what would it sound like? Would we hear harmonies? Would we hear melodies clearly and so forth? I didn't know. And as far as I could tell, although this world of data sonification is growing really rapidly, the sonification of phylogeny is unprecedented. Wayne's experiment would be a world first. I wanted this to have some basis of reality, so I started with a real data set of Habernatus. Habernatus also known as the paradise jumping spiders, most of which are native to North America. And the characteristics examined by that data set were the various sex chromosomes. And the issues of the, the, the chiasma localization. That is, a, that is not a term that I am familiar with. Okay, uh, bear with me for one last piece of cellular biology. If, if we must. Remember that you've got half of your chromosomes from each of your parents, right? Uh, yes. So, well, most of the time, the chromosomes from both contributors are paired up, but separate. But during meiosis, the, the moment at which sperm or eggs are being produced, the DNA from each pair of chromosomes is shuffled together, swapping the copies of genes from either parent. That's the actual moment of genetic recombination that gives you variations. Yeah. No, no, I am I am still with you. So the chiasma is the, the crossover point along the leg of the chromosome where that swap takes place. Got it. So if you're picturing these cute little X chromosomes with their little dancing legs, right? Four legs. It's like, where is that spot where they cross over and swap and swap their information? Yeah, okay. Wayne had data that included the physical measurements of where the chiasma was located for each of these species of Habernatus jumping spiders. It might be closer to the middle of the chromosome or closer to the end. So we were looking for a correlation between where the chiasmata occurred along the chromosome and the evolution of the Y chromosome. And at first glance, you might think, well, why should those even be connected? It's not as if you needed the chiasmata in a place to generate the Y. So they seem like two different aspects of the chromosomes. There had been a prediction that there should be some sort of correlation in this case that you might expect to see when there is a Y, the chiasmata would be more towards the tips of the chromosomes. So that was before our study. And it turned out that when we looked at it, that correlation is actually there. And in general, correlations like these are exactly what evolutionary biologists are looking for. Puzzling out why when one feature is like this, another feature tends to be like that. So Wayne decided to sonify this family tree of Habernatus jumping spiders, comparing the location of their chiasmata with the evolution of a new Y chromosome. So here's how it turned out. First, let's just focus on the speciation events, those points where lineages diverge. Every time you hear a tone, that's a spider lineage splitting in two. Then 
the next layer has to do with the chiasmata, where they are in the chromosomes. And because where they are in the chromosomes is variable, like it's a continuous variable, um, you're going to hear the tone going up and down in different amounts uh, as the chiasma slide up or down. So, you know, at this point... Uh, I'm thinking, hmm, I'm not, I'm not really hearing any grand symphonies yet. It's sort of intriguing, but it's not sounding particularly um, orderly to me. But, uh, you know, I went ahead and tried it now with the Y chromosomes. So here, you're going to hear a little ping every time a Y chromosome evolves, and a second little ping, a different sort, uh, if it actually reverses back to loss of Y chromosomes. And now, here are all of them, the, the speciation events, the chiasmata, and the Y chromosome, all together. I have heard 20th century classical music that sounded a little bit like that, but it really wasn't the symphony that I was expecting. I mean, I think I enjoyed that because I have a love of John Carpenter horror movies from like the 70s and 80s and 90s. And looking back, I can see that there were a few things wrong with it. The first being how it starts slowly and then gets busier and busier and busier as if suddenly all sorts of extra things are happening. Like, it just gets exponentially louder and denser until it suddenly ends, which isn't really the shape of most music that we tend to listen to. No, not, not mostly, no. So why do you think the data sounded like that? Well, speciation, right? Evolution tends to become more complex over time. All of the phylogenetic trees that I have ever seen begin with a single line and split and split and split and split and split until you've got an exponential number more species than when you started. So yeah, it makes perfect sense. But remember that these trees are constructed by calculating back from species that are still around today. So what's missing? I mean, we're missing all of the spiders that have gone extinct. Bingo. Part of the problem with extinct lineages is that we don't see them today. So we don't know exactly how many there are. In Habernatus, there are no known fossils. It's not like we can figure it out that way. But we can get an estimate of how many there likely would have been. And so one way to do this is to do a simulation of the dynamics of branching and extinction. And we can sort of populate all those lower parts of the tree where things went extinct and that would make it so that it was more even in terms of the busyness all the way through. And if you, you know, if you were to simulate those extinct lineages, it raises questions about whether you'd want to be able to hear the difference between the real and the imaginary ones. And in the end, with all of the, the various branches, you'd still have to deal with a lot of overlapping sound. The second thing that's wrong, well, there's probably more than one here, but the second thing that's wrong is that you're not able to really hear each of the voices and the melody that it might be playing because I'm using the same set of notes all through the whole tree. And that what I really needed to have done was somehow distinguish all these voices so that you could hear them separately. So it was almost like I should have said, okay, at the base of the tree, at the root, there was a divergence event, and that split between the woodwinds and the strings, for instance. And then on the lineage of strings, it split again between the bass and all the smaller ones. And likewise on the woodwinds. And that perhaps if you had it so that the voices were distinguishable, you could hear them as different. Then you could more easily hear the little melodies that were happening as chiasmata and y chromosome evolution followed each other. But I realized, oh, this is going to take a lot more work than I'm ready to do. There were lots of spiders waiting for me to study them. And so, four years ago, that's basically where the story would have ended. With a beautiful metaphor, and a not-quite-as-beautiful sonification. And I wasn't satisfied with that. I, uh, I was wondering... 
So I asked Wayne if I could take my own spin at it. And, and sort of try to take it to the next step as part of this podcast. Sure. Oh, amazing. I think that could be fun. Yeah. And so I tried. But after a few very enthusiastic but ultimately false starts, I too realized that this was a way bigger project than I had anticipated. Not least because at the time I, I didn't really know anything about making music. But it was this project that was my motivation to learn. Mm. And even while this project was on the back burner, I fell in love with learning the patterns of music and with the principles of electronic synthesis. I fell in love with making music just for its own sake. I enjoy listening to the music you make. Thank you. You know, looking back, I would say that this was one of my Divide Creek moments. Like, this story put me on a path, and I think I'll be on it for the rest of my life. I know that feeling. Yeah. But the other part was that in order to make it happen, I needed help. In fact, I needed a whole team. Uh, Mendel, that's called a, uh, a band. <laughs> <laughs> well, allow me to introduce Duncan Gear. Hello, what's up, party people? And Miriam Quick. The, the previous slide where we have the phylogenetic tree, does the horizontal axis represent time and a linear scale, or does it represent some other degree of change? Duncan and Miriam are information designers, and they're the hosts of a really wonderful podcast that's completely dedicated to data sonification. That's called Loud Numbers. Next. There must have been a, a molecular clock. This is Damien de Vienne, evolutionary biologist at the University of Lyon. So you have a branch length, usually represent the number of mutations that occurred along this branch. And then if you have an hypothesis of how fast mutation uh, accumulates, then you can transform that to time. I did actually end up finding one other precedent for phylogenetic sonification after Wayne's original attempt. It wasn't exactly a piece of music, but more like a, a proof of concept. Damien was a co-author, along with his friend, Henri. Uh, we've done a little uh, patch in pure data, which was sort of a test just to see if it's possible to, to sonify uh, trees like that. This is Henri Bouton, acoustic researcher at EarCam. That proof of concept that I found was really just a side project between him and Damien. We, we, we are friends since a lot of time. We used to do music and things like that, uh, but we never, uh, we've never worked together. And this was uh, the first opportunity to work together. And finally, local wizard slash generative music researcher and PhD student, Simon Overstall. Good morning. Who joined me in Pacific time zone solidarity whenever we met with our European collaborators. I need another coffee now. <laughs> so what did you do with this incredible team of people? Well, I think it's probably better if I spare you the prototypes and the meetings and the revisions. I'll just jump straight to what we ended up with. Because just like Wayne's version, I'm going to need to explain what you're about to hear. Mm. Yeah, all of, the, all of the best music requires extensive exposition, and <laughs> I am here for it. <laughs> well, in, in this case, yes. I'm all ears. So here we're using the same underlying data as Wayne. We've got these species of Habernatus jumping spiders. We know the location of their chiasmata and whether or not they have Y chromosomes. But the difference between our interpretations starts with how we represent time. Oh, okay. The tree itself is the same, and we're not simulating any extinct species. We're just approaching playback in kind of a, a different way. But what do you mean by that? So time still flows from the past to the present, but to avoid that exponential cacophony of all the parallel branches, we decided not to play all the lineages at the same time. That makes sense. Um, so what did you do instead? Well, you can kind of think about it as a series of divide creeks. We always start at the same place, like the headwaters of the stream, the root of the tree. The last common ancestor between all of these species. Yeah, exactly. So we 
follow that one lineage until at some point it splits in two. Then we follow those two branches until they both reach the present day. And because the, the scaling of time by branch length isn't linear, one branch will probably reach its end before the other one. But once they've both finished, we pause and cycle back to the beginning. Okay, so it's basically that there are just two voices at any single point. Got it, okay. And each of these trips from the root to the two tips represents approximately five million years of evolution. Wow, okay. And how long does it take in, like, real time? It, it kind of depends on which branch you're listening to, but uh, a few seconds to tens of seconds. Got it. Now, because we're only listening to the branches of this tree one pair at a time, it takes a lot longer to hear the whole thing. But I also think that makes it a lot more musical. Sure. But um, what are we actually hearing as we move down the creek, so to speak? So every time a, a lineage reaches a point of speciation, where its path might have gone one way or another, it plays a chord. Or, you know, more precisely, it plays an arpeggio. Which is like a chord with all the notes spread out. Mm. Mm -hmm. And the notes that are in that arpeggio depend on which daughter lineage our current branch followed, either descending to the right or to the left along the tree. Um, what do right and left mean in this situation? Right, so when you're drawing a phylogenetic tree, the, the order of the branches and really what's left and what's right, it, it's all pretty much arbitrary. So this is just a way of having a simple rule about the pitch of the notes that makes each unique branching path a unique melody. Okay, yeah. Left, right, one way, the other way. One way, the other way. And so each unique species plays out as a unique series of notes. Yeah, yeah. They all start in the same place, but eventually find themselves somewhere different. So what is the rule? What are the actual notes in that melody? What do they mean? Well, the, the chord that you'll hear, the arpeggio, is only ever at most four notes. And that's telling the story of four generations. So the great-great-grandmother note is forgotten, and the daughter note is added. Depending on that quote-unquote direction of descendants, a daughter note might be either a minor seventh above the pitch of its mother, or a, a perfect fifth below. Okay, so as we go, we forget a little bit about our ancestors. We may not know exactly what those species were, or what their names were, or what their dances were like. Yeah, but, but we do still have some sense of where we came from. Yeah. Who we came from. Yeah. Also, it's important that I point out that the arpeggio isn't in order of oldest to youngest. It's just in note order, either going up or down. And if it's descending or ascending, then it just gets put in its place. Okay. And to keep things musical, the notes will wrap to a four octave range. Okay. But the melody isn't actually the important part. That's what drummers tell me. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. So in this case, it's, it's really just describing the shape of the tree. What we're trying to hear is a correlation in the data, a connection between the evolution of a Y chromosome and the location of the chiasmata, these two seemingly unconnected aspects of jumping spider biology. Oh yeah, okay. So what I want you to pay attention to is the envelope of each note. That is the, the shape of the sound, either short and plucky, or long and sustained. Right. Wow. And, and what does the envelope tell us? That's the, the position of the chiasmata, those crossover points on the chromosomes. The closer the chiasma gets to the tip of the chromosome, the pluckier the note. Got it. And the evolution of a new Y chromosome is, is signaled by a few things. As they arrive along the branch, what you'll first hear is a triangle ringing out. Then, when you hear the arpeggio you'll notice that the direction will change from ascending to descending. 
So what I want you to listen for is how often pluckier notes are arranged in a descending arpeggio. Remember, the sound of a triangle is your cue that a Y chromosome has arrived. Okay. Will, will there be a quiz at the end? No, you can just enjoy yourself. Okay. Anyhow, that's, that's the main correlation that we were trying to listen for, but we didn't stop there. Next, we took Wayne's suggestion that the voices really ought to evolve more than just in terms of melody, but also timbre. Timbre. So, like, the character of the sound. Um, so do they split into, like, the strings and the woodwinds, and so on and so forth? Well, n- not exactly. So what I gather from all of that is that things are changing. That's the case. The more the spiders mutate, the more they sound like different instruments. This is actually like a way of describing the evolutionary distance along a branch. And one thing I find interesting is how suddenly these changes can sometimes happen. Mm. It, It could be an artifact of how we've processed the data, but it also seems that evolution can be a lot less gradual than we usually expect. Mm. Yeah, that reminds me of a concept that we call punctuated equilibrium, uh, which is just that, like, in evolution, things sort of can stay very stable for quite some time, and then suddenly there's a bunch of fairly large changes, right? The environment shifted dramatically in some way, or there was a development of some kind of mutation, and everything happens all at once. Exactly, yeah, it kind of comes out of nowhere. And another kind of subtle thing you might notice is that where the voices are positioned in stereo mimics their location on the tree. So you'll hear them moving around your head as they follow their branches, getting a little quieter as they go out towards the tips. Of course, of course, stereo can be part of this. I didn't think of that. So, I hope you're wearing headphones. Never listen to future ecologies without your headphones. We really appreciate it. Lastly, to mark time, between each cycle of dividing creeks, before we return to the root of the tree, you'll hear a short clip of one of our spider friends singing. We processed that through a synthesizer that models the physics of a plucked string, providing a kind of drone for the entire piece, as though the spiders themselves were strumming. So this is the spider playing a guitar, so to speak. (laughs) Wow. That's majestic. I, 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 I love that. And now, Spider's Song, take two, in its entirety.
That is really cool. It's, it's really beautiful. It's not at all what I would have expected. The, the, the sense of how, how richer are these spiders and these lineages comes across, you know? It's, it's not, it's, it, it, the, the, the multidimensionality of it becomes clear, right, of all of this. I feel like I want a whole collection of different phylogenies sonified like this and just put them on and let my brain simmer. The thing that I'm trying to locate is whether or not the pings, how they're connected with one another. And they're occasional enough that it's hard to find them, right? That could just be because the data is not showing it clearly. But the other thing is then, I also felt like it was the sort of thing, just like any music, that there's a little bit of a learning process as to how to hear a new sort of music, where you start to be able to notice the pattern that you hadn't noticed before, which actually is a lot like the way science works, right? You know, you get started and you think that there's no pattern there and it's actually just that you're not used to seeing it. The thing about using statistics is that if you have the right sort of data, lots of it, then you almost don't need statistics because it's just like, well, there it is. But the more subtle is the pattern, the fewer the replicates there are, the more that processing and examining and sifting is important to, to be able to actually recognize that signal there. And I think in this case, yeah, there's probably a pattern here between sex chromosome evolution and chiasma localization, but it's not a ton of replicates, and it's just two features talking to one another, so to speak. On the other hand, that's when, if you had something like, you know, DNA sequence data across the genome or something, there's probably a way to do it. Like, yeah, you'd still have to think a lot about how to turn it into sound, but there are probably things that once you get the right way to do it, you don't need to learn anything to be able to hear the patterns, right? It'll just jump right out at you. So, is it a symphony? No, and I, I think that's okay. This isn't supposed to be the way we listen to phylogeny, to the, the music of evolution. It's just a few ideas for how we could. And if you want to build on this one, I'm making the whole patch open source. 
That'll be up on our website. Futureecologies.net I can't wait to hear some spider remixes, or even some other phylogenies put through this system. Me neither, but, you know, maybe first it's worth asking, what's the point of this whole exercise? I can totally be the person that asked that, Mendel. What is the point? So, I... I guess I just want to make a distinction that there are really two big types of sonification. And across all of them, the goal is always to get the data to speak. But in my case, the key is that I already knew the story that I wanted to tell. Mm -hmm. And I wanted it to sound good, right? I wanted it to be at least a little musical. You you wanted to tell a story and you wanted it to sound good, which is why you make a podcast, presumably. (laughs) That's why we're here. And really, the the data were going to be there no matter what, right? And I I realized that being able to really hear them, to hear the meaning and the patterns, was so dependent on how I how I tuned the whole system towards those. But but if I were actually trying to do science, to discover something new, it would have been a completely different exercise. And that's really the difference between the explanatory and the exploratory. So, yeah, it sounds like, you know, to me that you were interested in the challenge, you were interested in developing your skills musically, and you were interested in telling this really interesting story. Yeah. But, um, you know, devil's advocate over here, does this have any scientific utility? Like, could data sonification for phylogeny be useful? For a, a lot of things, we are still in an exploratory mode and we don't have the hypotheses yet there. And, you know, maybe it'll turn out that you somehow tweak this so that it handles genomes in a particular way and it's something to do with, I don't know, the shapes of proteins or something like that. And you, you start playing it and people start noticing patterns from the way it sounds that then turn into testable ideas in the laboratory. And you could see that with with genomic data as being a distinct possibility. You know, in your sonification, like just as with all science, there has to be a little bit of imposition of our ideas because if we don't have ideas that we're slightly imposing on nature, we can't even make sense of it all, right? It's like this is a dialogue between the telling and the listening. And you don't want to go too far. You don't want to have it to be all in your head, the set of ideas or just your hypotheses with no grounding, no listening to what nature is trying to tell us. But you have to do that to some extent. And when the data are a little bit sparse or nature hasn't given you a lot of replicates or something like that, yeah, then you're going to be able to hear your own voice a little bit more strongly and nature's a little bit less. When you got tons of data or there's a really strong pattern there, then your voice is going to start to fade a little bit as it should. And you're going to hear nature speak more clearly, but it's always going to be a balance. And, you know, we can't remove ourselves from science. The observer is always there. The preconceptions that the observer has will always be there, but hopefully there'll be enough listening that nature's always there whispering to keep us at least somewhat connected to reality. This is, I don't know if it's tangent, but... I studied experimental film as my undergrad. I'm a film school dropout. And I loved experimental film, not because I would stare at it really hard and think about it really hard and try to derive the meaning from all of the kind of madness up there on the screen. No, I would sit there watching those films, often late at night in a lecture hall with very few people in it, And I would just let them wash over me and allow them to do things to my brain that other narrative cinema couldn't do, right? Because it's so programmed to tell you this particular thing or that particular thing. And I like that about this, that, you know, somebody has put effort, obviously, into into making it beautiful, into making it comprehensible to us. But... There's a lot of meaning in there, and it's not at all clear exactly what it is from the jump. You have to let it wash over you. And maybe we'll learn something about the phylogeny of jumping spiders, or maybe what, you know, jumps out at us will be something entirely different. 
thank you for giving me the opportunity to bathe my brain in the music of jumping spiders. You're welcome. And yeah, the, the science is just one part of it. I felt like my job was to honor the beauty of these little spiders. They are quite beautiful. Um, I guess that raises the question, like, these spiders have presumably evolved all of these things to appeal to one another. Why do you think that they're so captivating to us as well? Well, at some level, it's a coincidence, right? Like, it's just happenstance that female jumping spiders seem to respond to the same sort of things that we do, right? Like flashy colors and interesting vibrations, just like us. So male jumping spiders have evolved to be dazzling, and dazzling in ways that appeal to both of us. Mm. And I think over evolutionary time, jumping spiders are literally being shaped by, you might say, their own attention to beauty. You know, science is typically defined by the very rigorous style of testing that we do. But there's the other half of that, which is the generation of ideas that we then subsequently test. And that generation of ideas doesn't have to come in any rigorous way. It can come from anything. And an attention to beauty, that's, that's jostling the way we look at the world. It's giving us surprises. It's helping us to notice things that we would have never noticed. An attention to beauty may make us think about nature in ways that generate they generate new ideas that we can then test, right? It's a source of the creativity that allows science to proceed. So that actually has a benefit on discovering truth. And those things that I've discovered, either about the spiders themselves or about how we approach nature as scientists, the methods we use, those have useful consequences. You know, we'll learn about how the world works and that can help us survive, in fact. But a lot of my pursuit of science is connected with this pursuit of beauty. It's it's a motivation. It's I, I, it, In some ways, it's almost as if the science is a byproduct. You know, I fell in love with the beauty of the world. When I looked at that jumping spider, Fiddy, I saw a part of myself there. There was a sense of, of something in common. And I know that I fell in love first with the jumping spider, but I also know it could have been something else. It, it could have been a fungus, it could have been a beetle, it could have been an earthworm. I think if you look closely enough, you can really fall in love with just about anything. As I've gone around the world and found these amazingly beautiful spiders, many of which I know are not yet described by scientists, I wonder, am I the first person to see this sort of spider? Like, has anybody ever looked at this sort of spider before? But at the same time as I do that, I also wonder, am I going to be the last to see them alive? Because many of the environments that we have out there are disappearing. The forests are being cut down, habitat loss, and now climate change is having an effect everywhere. As a scientist, I think the loss of these species is a loss of data, of course, like we won't be able to learn from them anymore, but it's also simply a loss of beauty. You know, you have to think about how we're going to turn that around. And we could say, well, we need to do it because of this, and we could sort of impose a sense of morally we need to do this. But I don't think people tend to respond well to an imposed ethics like that. In fact, I tend to think that we don't choose what we want to do by our ethics, we tend to retrofit our ethics to what we want to do. So if we're really going to change the world, we have to basically change what we care about, change our desires. We have to fall in love with the planet. We have to fall in love with all the beauty that's here. So as a scientist, I feel I have a moral responsibility, not just to talk about results, but to talk about beauty. I have to talk about more than the truths that I uncover. For all of us, scientists, musicians, and maybe even jumping spiders, our sense of beauty is part of our intrinsic motivation. Each of us, in our own way, witnesses the world and responds to it. Because there is no such thing as beauty without an audience.
This series of Future Ecologies was produced by me, Mendel Skolsky, but not without help from so many others. Thanks to my amazing sonification collaborators, Damien Devienne, Miriam Quick, Duncan Gear, Simon Overstall, and Henri Bouton. And if you're into this sort of thing, then you'll love Duncan and Miriam's podcast, Loud Numbers. Thanks, of course, to my co-host, Adam Huggins, and our guest, Wayne Madison. Our sonification was produced in Max MSP using phylogenetic data gathered by Wayne Madison and Dr. Genevieve Leduc Robert. For the source code, the full-length track, and to learn more about how it works, head to futureecologies.net. All of our supporters on Patreon will be getting even more behind the scenes and other bonus content. To get access, join our community at patreon.com slash futureecologies. All the Jumping Spider audio recordings you heard came courtesy of Dr. Damien Elias and his lab at UC Berkeley. Sonification examples came from Chris Chaff, the Chandra X-ray Observatory, Mark Evanstein, and Mark Temple. Special thanks to Ruby Singh, Vincent Van Hoff, T.O.K., Aaron Robinsong, Kate Hurley, Kieran Fanning, and to Loeb Spatial Sound Studio, Kate DeLorme, Hannah Acton, Ian Wyatt, Eric Chad, and Sev Shaban. And thanks to Leia Tess for the amazing illustrations. Funding for this series was provided by the Canada Council for the Arts, but ongoing support for this podcast comes from listeners just like you. To keep this show going, join our community at patreon.com slash future ecologies. And if you like what we're doing, please just spread the word. It really helps. Till next time, thanks for listening. <laughs>